Welcome everyone to the Ashkatar, Ashtakar Frontiers of Science Lectures in the Eberly College of Science. Good morning, I'm Charles Anderson, Associate Professor of Biology in the Eberly College of Science and the Chair of our College's Sustainability Council. I'll be your moderator for this year's lecture series. Before we introduce our speaker, I wanted to go over a few housekeeping notes. We will be recording today's lecture, which will be posted to the lecture series website as soon as it is ready. At the end of the lecture, there will be a question and answer session. You can use the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen to enter your questions, which I will share with our speaker. The lecture series was founded by Abe Ashtakar in 1995, soon after he arrived at Penn State as director of a new research center that subsequently evolved to become the Institute for Gravitation and the Cosmos. It owes its success to tireless efforts and meticulous planning by Barbara Kennedy who presided over the series during its first 25 years, making it one of the most successful science outreach events in central Pennsylvania. This year, the Ashtakar Frontiers of Science Lectures are entitled Sustainability, How Science Can Help Achieve the UN's 2030 Sustainable Development Goals. The series will focus on the United Nations 17 Sustainable Development Goals or SDGs, which are a call to action to end poverty, protect the planet, and ensure that all people enjoy peace and prosperity by the year 2030. Today's featured speaker is Dr. Jan Lowe, a principal scientist with the International Potato Center, or CIP, based in their regional office for Africa in Nairobi, Kenya. During the past decade, Dr. Lowe managed the Sweet Potato Action for Security and Health in Africa Research Project and co-led the Sweet Potato for Profit and Health Initiative. The initiative was a multi-partner, multi-donor initiative that reached 6.3 million African households in 15 target countries with improved varieties of sweet potato, promoting their diversified use. Dr. Lowe obtained her doctorate in agricultural ac economics at Cornell University, minoring in nutrition. Having worked for over 25 years in sub-Saharan Africa, she has focused with her team at CIP on developing and promoting biofortified orange fleshed sweet potato to combat vitamin A deficiency. Lowe also served as president of the African Potato Association from 2011 to 2013. In 2016, along with two CIP sweet potato breeders, Maria Andrade and Robert Mwanga and Howarth Boyce of Harvest Plus, Dr. Lowe was awarded the World Food Prize for her work on biofortification. Today, Dr. Lowe will enlighten us on building healthier food systems for sub-Saharan Africa with nutritious, resilient orange-fleshed orange sweet potato with a focus on how orange-fleshed sweet potato can contribute to and fit into an improved food system, noting the bottlenecks that still need to be addressed to unleash its full potential. Dr. Lowe, thank you so much for being here today. We look forward to learning more about this very interesting topic. Well, thanks to Penn State and particular for, to Dr. Ashtakar for creating this opportunity to be able to speak to a broad audience, I believe of scientists and also members of the community in central Pennsylvania. Um, I'm quite excited to be able to have this opportunity. Actually, I was in Penn State uh, in 2017 and would much prefer to be there in person but of course, this is a good way to reach an even broader audience beyond Pennsylvania as well. So thank you again for this opportunity. Uh, today, I wanna to speak about building healthier food systems for Sub-Saharan Africa, where I've worked for over 25 years, um, and particularly focusing on the work I've been involved with on nutritious, resilient orange flesh sweet potato. Here in the photo, you can see how sweet potato can be eaten by itself or integrated into many of the traditional and emerging dishes in a place like Northern Ethiopia. Actually, this was taken in the Tigray region last year. Now, I think we all recognize that the pandemic has laid bare the inadequacies of the global food system. The weaknesses were quite well known, but really when you look at it, 
many countries now are battling the triple burden of malnutrition. And what do we mean by that? First of all, uh, we have the undernourished, the malnutrition due to undernourishment, which was affecting 690 million people pre-COVID, and they're estimating, they don't have the numbers fixed yet, that 2020 will add another 83 to 132 million to the malnourished population. Then micronutrient malnutrition is often called hidden hunger. As I always say, nobody wakes up saying, I feel my, you know, vitamin A deficient today. So often this is a malnutrition that we don't see until it gets the more serious complications down the road. And then we have the problem of overweight and obesity, which is emerging uh, to be a serious problem, particularly in the higher echelons of uh, economic society. Under nourishment is associated with 45% of the rates of under five mortality. Micronutrient malnutrition uh, is estimated to affect about 2 billion people. And now overweight is catching up with 1.9 billion adults in this category. But we shouldn't just look at the negative of what's happened with uh, this food system because really Credit is due. Just imagine the food system, no matter what inadequacies it may have, has fed a burgeoning world population that grew from 3 billion in 1960 to 7.8 billion in 2020. That's a lot of people to feed. So the Sustainable development goals were adopted by 193 countries in 2015. And really what it's done in our work and the work of many institutions is pushed us from what I would call a food security framework that was very focused on getting adequate diets and good utilization of the foods to a much more complex food systems perspective that I think will be one of the focuses of this lecture series. And really it was bringing in that aspect of the environmental effects of agriculture and our other activities on the planet and the need to look and urgently look for more sustainable practices that drove this. And we note that food systems or producing and delivering food uh, uses 85% of the world's water supply and is estimated to contribute one fifth of its greenhouse gases. So we're moving from a perspective under the food security framework of feeding people to much more of a concept of nourishing the population. So the goal is to make our food systems deliver better nutrition while minimizing its environmental impact. So this is a typical com a conceptual framework that people are showing to describe this more complex food system uh, approach, which you can see is tied into the sustainable development goals. And you have your food supply chains, your food environments, you know, what's affecting how that food is delivered and what is delivered and how it is marketed. And then how does the consumer react uh, to both of those issues? And ultimately, what does that mean for the final diet that one actually in, uh, takes in, in terms of quantity, quality, its diversity and uh, the growing importance and problems associated with its safety? And that leads to measurable nutrition and health outcomes, but also it has great economic and social and environmental impacts. Many, uh, in, particularly in the uh, people working in the global uh, food arena are calling for a radical overhaul of the system. We are living in a world which is seeing increasing urbanization and globalization. Um, you know, just thinking about Sub-Saharan Africa, we had about a quarter of the population living in cities in 1970. 
Uh, now it's up to 41% in 2017, and it will be oh, probably around 60% by 2030. And with urbanization, you know, it's been associated with income growth and food industry consolidation, but, and the rise of the demand for more convenient foods, and we've seen the growth in what we call ultra processed foods. With globalization, the increased length of the food chain has been a norm, obviously with lots of discussions about foods being shipped all over the world and that carbon impact of that. And we've seen increased complexity of the food environment and increased waste issues, particularly as we've gotten into fancier packaging regimes. I want to give what I call the frightening tale of Indomie in Nigeria, just to give you an idea how Africa has not been excluded from this globalization of uh, the food system and what I would call uh, the less healthy ultra processed foods. Indomie instant noodles came into Nigeria, which is the largest African country with 25% of uh, Sub-Saharan Africa's population. It came in in 1988. No instant noodles were being consumed in 1988. Um, the first factory was in 1995, and now there are 10 factories and 17 other companies making instant noodles. Nigeria has now become the 12th largest consumer of instant noodles in the world. Um, what bothers me, it's not that I'm anti-instant noodle uh, per se. Um, I know people, uh, it's a good graduate student food for those who are there, but um, here it's the way in which it's being marketed, which is of great concern. It's being heavily marketed as a healthier food than the staple carbohydrates that Nigerians have relied on for centuries. Their yams and, you know, other um, uh, roots and tubers, as well as um, you know, the grain crops. The ads emphasize quick and easy options for overworked moms. They target children. They've painted primary schools throughout the country. And this is tasty nutrition that's good for you. If you look at the ingredients on this package, very low in nutritive content, high on calories, fat, and sodium, and low in dietary fiber. So this is not a healthy food. It costs 17 cents per 70 gram packet. So one thinks, well, that's pretty cheap. Um, but then when you put it in a per kilogram term, that becomes a very expensive $2.49. What's frightening about this as well, it's the, this noodle brand is actually endorsed by the Nutrition Society of Nigeria. So, this is to me is a perfect example of what is not good for the continent or for you know, the general population because they are being sold something and told it is nutritious when it is clearly not nutritious. Looking back now at the food supply issue overall, it has been heavily dominated by the grain crops. If we look at our production systems on Earth, we have 7,000 edible plant species. Six of them really dominate in the global food system, maize, rice, wheat, sugarcane, soybeans, and palm oil. But you may be surprised to learn that 42.5% of global calories just come from three crops, maize, rice, and wheat. And agriculture research has prioritized these grain staple crops and oil seeds. And if we look historically over the last 40 years, the supply of micronutrients in the food supply have actually fallen. Unfortunately, the most nutrient dense foods, that means nutrients per uh, 100 kilocalories, for instance, are also the most perishable, the vegetables, the fruits, the animal source foods. And in low-income countries, uh, coal chains are insufficient and often costly to operate with electricity. So the reality is, and the reality that we work under, is the fact, if you look at the contrast between the proportion of diet, um, the proportion of kilocalories per capita per day, 
In low income countries, this study published by FAO in 2020 showed that on average in low income countries, people are consuming 2,126 kilocalories per capita per day. And 69% of those calories come from cereals, roots, tubers, and plantains, okay? In contrast, in the high income countries, 31% are coming from those staples. And you see a lot more consumption of eggs and dairy and fish and meat. Uh, in percentage terms, vegetable consumption and fruit isn't that high uh, in terms of calorie contribution. And you can't say that the highest income diet is healthy because 31% of the calories are coming from sugar and fats. So it's not that it's a healthy diet either. But another study that recently came out that looked at the costs of healthy diets across a number, 77 different countries, mostly developing countries, found that the minimum healthy diet would cost almost five times as much as an energy sufficient diet. So if you just meet your energy needs, that's why the poor depend on these staples. These, um, but a healthy diet is usually beyond the reach of the majority of households. An interesting study came out that showed uh, that dominant grain staples have um, uh, really gotten the bulk of the research funding. This is a, a interesting study that tried to look at the number of publications and link it and ex, um, evaluate it compared to the nutrients that a particular crop is currently contributing to the food system. And if we organize the crops here from the most nutrient rich in terms of a food index score based on nine key nutrients, protein, fiber, vitamin A, C, and E, and the minerals, calcium, iron, magnesium, and potassium. Actually, sweet potato among the starches comes up on, on top, 161, twice as much as the next one, which is oats. You can see maize is way down at the bottom at 24. And so this study concluded that sweet potato, potato and wheat have the largest overall research deficits compared to the nutrients they are currently contributing to the food system. Now this obviously is a proxy analysis. They didn't have the actual money amounts invested in research, but we know from looking at the data that one of the key driving reasons why the dominant staple grains have maintained relatively low prices compared to more nutrient dense foods is due to the heavy investment that has been made over the last 50 years into research to increase their productivity. Because clearly, you know, hunger and zero hunger is a big goal. Hunger is driven by whether you have enough calories in your body. And so politicians um, obviously want a, a population that's not going to riot during, during, due to hunger. We want to avoid famine. So really the investment has been on the crops that fill stomachs. Uh, this study also notes that there's, in terms of they looked at climate, what they call climate winners, where climate suitability was likely to increase under climate change, and they saw its potentials for more investment being needed in rye, oats, millet, sorghum, and buckwheat in their respective climate zones. So this is where the concept, uh, you know, emerged uh, in the 1990s of biofortification. The idea since the poor get over 60% of their calories from staples, if we can enhance the micronutrient content of those staples, that's a very effective strategy for addressing micronutrient malnutrition in the poorest of societies, particularly in rural areas. So I wanna turn now, that gives you sort of the backdrop of, to understand the context in which we feel orange flesh sweet potato because of its very high nutrient content. Clearly one small root meets the daily vitamin A needs of a young child, which is fantastic. But it's also, as you saw from that index, 
very uh, good source of vitamin C, K, and E, several B vitamins, and several minerals. So it's quite a nutritious food. It's the seventh most important food crop in the world. For whatever reason, um, in Sub-Saharan Africa, the dominant varieties that came from the Americas, probably through the Portuguese, um, uh, are, are mostly white fleshed, having no beta carotene, which the body converts into vitamin A. So in the Sub-Saharan African context, we were introducing what we would call a marginal change. Get, people already know the sweet potato, it's widely grown. It's switching from varieties that have white flesh to varieties that are orange fleshed. Sounds easy, but actually it took a number of years to make this happen as I will be describing because you have to get all those other traits in that make it acceptable to the consumers in your area. When we, I first started this work in the mid 1990s, there was a real conventional wisdom, why bother to do this? They, there was a belief uh, in the published literature that Africans and Asians will not eat orange flesh sweet potatoes, mostly because early efforts to introduce them failed. And one of the things that they failed to understand, we ended up going and raising money and doing some small pilot work in Kenya among 20 women's groups. And there was a failure to understand that they were being rejected, not due to the color, which actually people love, but due to the texture. Because we were introducing uh, orange flesh varieties from other countries, and these varieties had what they call low dry matter. They were watery. And the white flesh varieties or the yellow flesh varieties in Sub-Saharan Africa it's a secondary uh, center diversity of sweet potato, and they're very high in dry matter, often over 30%. Whereas the orange sweet potatoes you know in the United States, which sometimes are incorrectly called yams, uh, those sweet potatoes in the United States tend to have 18 to 21% dry matter. So we found that the love, young children love those low dry matter types, but the adults hate them. And, and guess who decides what to plant? Obviously, it's the adults. So we learned a lot from this pilot effort. We also learned that the yellow flesh varieties had a variety of different carotenoids, not just beta carotene. So you couldn't be assured that they had enough actually to make it biofortified in terms of health impact. So we decided to stick with a clear message of just eat orange, eat orange flesh varieties. We also learned during this pilot experience that it was easy to incorporate the orange flesh sweet potato into weaning foods and into young diet, uh, young child diet uh, feeding practices to improve feeding frequency and incorporate it into products as shown here as the woman is doing like japati. The next conventional wisdom we had to get over was uh, a belief in the nutrition community due to studies that came out in the late 1990s that the plant sources of vitamin A had low bio bioavailability and hence could not impact vitamin A status. There had been a six to one conversion rate between beta carotene and retinol that had been there for years and new studies were showing different levels. Um, and they were always criticizing that food-based approaches using foods weren't actually showing the evidence to convince people that they could really impact vitamin A status. But on the other hand, being in the agriculture nutrition arena, there was a great unwillingness of donors to fund such studies to generate the evidence because things were very siloed in the late 1990s, early 2000s. The health people would say a project that I wanted to do um, was an agricultural project. The ag people would say, no, no, this is a health project. And the idea of funding multidisciplinary research uh, was not the norm. So after three and a half years of going to 21 different donors, I finally found a donor that would support uh, community level uh, quasi-experimental design study that I conducted in central Mozambique from 2003 to 2005. 
And the idea here was to have two intervention groups at different intensities and one control group. And here we really use what I call our integrated framework uh, for doing agriculture nutrition work. And there are three pathways here that you can clearly see. One is the access obviously to the beta carotene rich sweet potatoes that's propagated by vines. And the idea here is to produce more energy and beta carotene per hectare to get a yield advantage, both in calories as well as vitamin A as the key micronutrient. The second pathway is the demand creation and empowerment through knowledge pathway. Uh, we work on a lot here on behavioral change to actually work with caregivers to improve feeding practices, to increase young child feeding frequency and diet diversity, because that there we want to have it make an impact on young child health. By um, and then the third. Uh, pathway to get our sustained adoption and use through market development. And we've uh, hypothesized if you earn income from sales and roots and processed products using the sweet potato, that will drive demand and lead to increased area under production. Okay. And we were hoping that also people would use the income they earned to buy more vitamin A rich foods and, and maybe even get better health services. So the market work and the community awareness work sort of help reinforce the demand creation efforts at the village level, but also at the urban level. So this was the, our work uh, that started in Mozambique. We said, you can see the Capulana behind me. These were the skirts that the women would wear and, and could purchase on the market to help promote orange flesh sweet potato painted buildings and marketing stalls, building the orange brand. Because vitamin A first was not a very known concept in Mozambique. As you can imagine, this is a country that emerged from 20 years of civil war and 61% of the women in our study area hadn't been to any formal education. So creating awareness, promoting at the same time all the other vitamin A rich foods, not just the orange flesh sweet potato, and to increase demand for healthy foods by having people associate orange and green with healthy uh, uh, foods to eat. So did this intervention that lasted for 18 months impact child diet and, and vitamin A status? We found compared to the control group, uh, looking at double differences, uh, that median nutrient intakes uh, were eight times higher in our intervention children than in our control children. Um, orange flesh sweet potato was contributing 35% on average to vitamin A intake and on 90% on days when it was consumed. And we did see a reduction in prevalence of 15% in vitamin A deficiency between the control children, um, and, between the intervention children and the control children. Um, and there was a slight also increase in energy, um, uh, not as significant as the increase uh, in vitamin A intakes. So then the next was to build up the evidence base. That was a study in a very limited population. Uh, we worked together with Harvest Plus, who by that point had come on board as a uh, program within the uh, international agriculture research system that was dedicated to biofortification. And it was working on a lot of other crops, not just orange flesh sweet potato. Um, but Harvest Plus and SIP, we worked together to undertake what we called the Reaching End Users Project in Uganda and Mozambique, which was basically to see, could we take this integrated model and scale it up uh, to, it was 14,000 households uh, in Mozambique and 10,000 households in Uganda. And really to compare what is the intensity of the community level intervention that we need. So in model one, we had two years of the community level nutrition education and uh, intervention. In model two, we just did one year. Was that sufficient? And the study uh, provided some very positive results. We had greater than 
uh, 60% uptake of the adoption of the orange flesh sweet potato, and we had very positive impacts on vitamin A intakes among the children and their mothers. And we measured vitamin A status in Uganda. We already had the results from Mozambique and found a positive impact on status on the youngest children. But more importantly, we looked at the costs of using the integrated approach. And because our model two results uh, weren't significantly different from our model one results, and they were 30% cheaper to implement, that was positive news for getting the cost per beneficiary down. So the direct beneficiary cost was higher in Mozambique than in Uganda because it's a much less densely populated country. Um, but we were able to get marginal costs to be much lower, particularly if indirect beneficiaries were included. And given the disability life you're saved, which is a, a metric used by the nutrition community, uh, we estimated it was 15 to $20 uh, per disability life you're saved, which made it a cost-effective intervention. So finally, some really core evidence available to convince the nutrition community that an integrated ag nutrition approach could work. But at the same time, and this particularly hit me when I was running the field study in central Mozambique, it was the recognition that these varieties that we had brought in and they were the best bets from around the world and released in Mozambique just weren't good enough. Actually, this variety, for instance, Resisto people loved the taste. It had excellent beta carotene content. It had a nice shape for marketing. So it was our most popular commercial variety. But it had insufficient vine vigor and drought tolerance to survive. During the dry season, when we would compare it in the valley bottoms where we had residual moisture, we would grow a second crop. And actually the resisto would produce more than the local variety, Kanasumana, showed here. But what happened by the end of the dry season, there would be no more vines of resisto left. It put all, it sunk all its energy into the roots. And Kanasumana would last in the farming system because it sacrificed root yield for vine yield and kept its vine alive. It also just had some different physiology in its root structure. And that's really when we knew we had to be breeding in Africa for Africa, not only for the organoleptic qualities, the taste qualities to be better for our target populations, but to get these key traits we needed in terms of drought tolerance. One of the major constraints when you try and tackle breeding, of course, is the old conventional breeding approach took eight years from crossing to release. It was very linear in thinking. Um, and so typically uh, the national programs, there were only two in Africa breeding when we started in 2005, yeah, in Uganda and in South Africa. But then we were fortunate enough to get funding from the Bill and Linda Gates Foundation for the Sasha project, which Charles mentioned that I was leading. And that enabled us to implement a new concept, a conventional breeding concept called accelerated breeding, which basically takes advantage of the vegetatively propagated uh, crop nature of sweet potato. And so the idea here that was developed by Wolfgang Grunenberg, our breeder based in Lima, is that you have more sites earlier in the breeding process, okay? And one of those sites is your drought prone site or your high virus uh, site that puts stress onto the varieties. So you put a lot more um, uh, two to three sites in year one and year two, again, more sites and knocking more material out early in your breeding process. So basically we're compressing the time that it takes to go through a breeding cycle. Concurrently, 
with launching the Sasha project in 2009, we also launched what we call the Sweet Potato for Profit and Health Initiative, which we hope to get greater support um, from other donors and have other partners come in and work with us. And the Alliance for Green Revolution in Africa provided grants to nine national programs so they could do their own breeding. So under Sasha, we at SIP had three population development programs uh, where we were doing the high-end breeding for the major traits. In Uganda, virus resistance, the most important disease problem in sweet potato, in Mozambique, drought tolerance. And in Ghana, we were breeding for low sugar or low sweet sweet potato. And these are the uh, 16 countries we targeted under the initiative where we really wanted to enhance the lives of African farmers through access to these improved varieties of sweet potato and promoting their diversified use. And what was that community of practice able to achieve by 2020? So really enormous progress when you think that we had only two countries breeding in 2005 and now we have you know 14 countries breeding that's a great transition. We've seen 162 varieties released in 16 countries with 104 of those being orange fleshed and 112 of those have been bred by 12 African programs. And 16 varieties are becoming uh, what we call winners in the sense that they're being released in more than one country. So they have more widespread adaptation than others. We even have six purple flesh varieties uh, that have been released in, in Mozambique and Ghana. And the purple varieties have anthocyanins, which are also a very important antioxidant. And in drought tolerance, we've made great strides with 27 varieties from Mozambique, seven from Malawi, and two from South Africa. I won't go into details here, but another major breakthrough in our breeding efforts have been uh, validating the concept that we can apply hybrid breeding concepts to sweet potato. And by using reciprocal recurrent selection and two separate populations, we can get that hybrid jump. Uh, you can see the two small parents there and the offspring in our quantity traits, in our yield traits, uh, through a, using this hybrid breeding scheme, which we have now adopted in all of our uh, breeding programs. Most exciting in the past couple of years is we finally got a breakthrough by focusing on elite families that generate good offspring in our virus breeding work in Uganda. Sweet potato virus disease, SPVD, is, uh, can be really devastating. You can see uh, a virus infected plant producing no roots versus all the roots pr uh, produced in a healthy plant being held by Robert Mwanga, one of my fellow co laureates. And finally, we were able to uh, develop through hybrid breeding, getting uh, and being able to select the elite families really getting uh, higher levels of virus resistance in the offspring population. So this is quite exciting because this is the progress on virus breeding typically has been slow because it requires huge numbers um, and getting that consistent virus reading year after year has been a challenge. I should also mention here that in terms of our virus work, we also do a lot of pathology work that I haven't uh, been, I won't be able to go into today, but we are, our virologist Jan Kreutz is working with David Hughes of the plant village at Penn State on artificial intelligence and using artificial intelligence to help farmers in the field identify different viruses and give them recommendations and advice on how to manage them. So we're quite excited about the potential collaborations with institutions like Penn State. Uh, for getting some of these high-end digital technologies uh, to help uh, smallholder farmers. And basically, as I say to our breeders, it doesn't make any difference if we release these varieties if we can't get them out to farmers. And I still think the greatest challenge we have in vegetatively propagated crops 
is their relatively low multiplication rate and the fact that they are vegetatively propagated, which means um, they are uh, perishable and they are bulky to move compared to grains and seeds. So we've done a lot of work in this area that I will just briefly touch on. But one is working with our uh, national NARIs partners uh, to get this early generated seed moved I'm on much more of a business basis so they can set up rotation funds. Because if you don't have the clean disease-free pre-basic seed, everything else slows down. And we've worked a lot in developing a sandponics technology, which is fertigation in sand in the screenhouses to speed up and uh, have a more economical way to conventionally multiply this pre-basic seed and manuals are available. Then it goes down to the field level. We developed a whole system of net tunnels that economically only pay if we use them in really high virus pressure areas to let the next level of farmer multipliers who are trained to do quality vine multiplication keep their own stock of quality disease-free starter material. So they don't have to go back to the research station every year. And then we get to the open field multiplication. We've been working to promote the idea of quality declared seed programs. And we've seen in terms of economics that multipliers usually have to become vine root enterprises to ensure their sustainability because if a farmer is good, they can retain their own vines year after year after year. So it's really hard uh, for a business to be built just on vine sales for seed um, because usually there has to be a very strong market for roots to drive that commercial uh, vine sale. So it's better for people to be involved in seed production but also have roots as a key income earning operation. So our, the holy grail is to establish demand-led cost-effective seed systems for the dissemination of new varieties and get people to invest in high quality planting material because disease-free planting material will produce higher yields. We're very excited about this method we've uh, developed for drought prone areas where our poorest farmers often are. We're really getting through the dry season and having planting material for the next year is a challenge. You can imagine if you have that plot of sweet potatoes out there, you're attracting every cow in the, in the region to come eat your plot during the dry season. So what we've, uh, building on a traditional practice, we've improved it. And basically the triple S method is you layer healthy, undamaged, medium-sized roots in a bucket. Uh, in cool, dry sand. And you can keep that in your house during the dry season up to six months. And then six to eight weeks before the rains start, you plant it out in a protected seed bed and you can get early quality seed as soon as the rains start, just watering it twice a week. Whoops. Sorry, I went the wrong way. And right now we're trying to scale this out and looking at different uh, dissemination strategies for going to scale using videos and demonstrations or combined videos and demonstrations. It is really the challenge of this technology. It's an easy technology, but it's knowledge intensive. It's not costly to do, but you have to get that information out there. So that's what we're working on now. How can we cost effectively take this to scale? And this is going on in about nine countries now. Out of this method grew the method, to, okay, you can also store more roots in sand for consumption. And we can expand the availability of sweet potato with the double S method, um, using a sandbox in the house or using a covered uh, pit that's dug outside. And again, this has proved to be a way in which we can increase the availability of sweet potato in the diet throughout the year. Again, this is for drought prone areas where you know food insecurity uh, as well as micronutrient malnutrition are serious problems. Major limitations of these methods obviously is you can only store in one pit or sandbox about 200 kilos maximum. 
We've continued to build on our earlier experience doing community-based integrated nutrition agriculture work uh, by doing another study called Mama Sasha, where we really linked in to improving uh, nutritional counseling during pregnancy. The first thousand days, the time of pregnancy of the mother through the first two years of birth, we know are the critical period for good nutrition for good young child growth, but also to give more attention to the women themselves to have healthy pregnancies. And when we started doing this work in Western Kenya, there really wasn't uh, nutrition being taught at, as, par as part of antinatal natal counseling. So we link giving out vouchers for sweet potato roots as part of the counseling service and then backstopped uh, the uh, advice they were getting at the clinics with pregnant mothers clubs that ran once a month to reinforce the messaging and try and get men involved as well in those meetings in the village. Um, I, again, we do this to build the evidence base. Um, we found that if people just partially uh, participated, not in everything, but in some of the activities, we saw uptake of orange flesh sweet potato and increased intakes in the diet, but we really only got the impact on vitamin A status and stunting in young children if they participated fully in the clinics and in the pregnant mothers clubs and obviously growing the sweet potato. We've continued to improve on our work, working very closely with Emory University. We're quite excited about Another aspect of breeding in how do we deal with diet quality as part of our work. And again, when we do this work, we don't just talk about sweet potato, but we talk about other locally available nutrient rich foods. And here the emphasis in Ethiopia is we're using what we call the healthy baby toolkit, which has a feeding bowl that has lines to indicate the appropriate portion size you should be giving young children under two years of age at different ages. And that goes with the messaging on the counseling card about the feeding frequency for the young child. And it comes with a spoon that has slots in it. So if the porridge is too thin, which is a major common problem in Sub-Saharan Africa, it slips through. So it gives women guidance on how to get the right density and nutrient density and thickness into their porridges. Again, in this new approach, we really encourage both the men and women to come and participate as members of these healthy living clubs. And at each lesson, they set goals for the next effort. I should also note uh, that sweet potato leaves, we probably don't promote them enough, but the leaves are highly nutritious and an outstanding source of lutein, which is also important in preventing macular degeneration. Um, some countries eat lots of leaves, always have. Other African countries like Uganda consider leaves to be animal feed. Um, so we have to convince people to try the leaves and see if they like to eat them in countries where they aren't used to eating them. But we've done quite a bit of work developing uh, silage recipes because off-season feed is an issue. And because of the high protein content of sweet potato as a green, it's an excellent complementary feed for dairy cattle. So if you chop fresh vines 50-50 with napier grass, you can increase your milk output 20%. Sweet potato vines and roots are major animal feeds in Asia, but still really underexploited in use in sub-Saharan Africa. So this is another area where we expect to see considerable growth over the next decade. Our focus to reach urban areas has really concentrated on the development of the fresh root markets and trying to promote that, but also on processed products using orange flesh sweet potato puree. You can see the steamed and mashed uh, puree in this photo here. And why puree? Because it's just more economically viable than sweet potato flour given our current levels of productivity of sweet potato among smallholder farmers. Uh, it just takes 1.6 kilograms of fresh roots to make a kilogram of puree. 
compared to four to five kilograms of fresh roots to make a kilogram of flour. So it's just pure economics. Sweet potato puree is much cheaper than wheat flour, whereas uh, sweet potato flour is more expensive than wheat flour. So here we've been promoting wheat flour substitution because most African countries import uh, a high percentage, if not all of their wheat flour. So this is a win-win in terms of foreign exchange savings and also creating markets for farmers. Um, we can go in breads, usually 30 to 35% replacement of wheat flour up in japati, the flat breads, we can go up to 50 to 60%. And the power biscuits that are commercialized now in Rwanda have 43% of the wheat flour replaced by orange flesh sweet potato puree. We have developed a shelf storable puree that can keep for three months without refrigeration with locally available preservatives. So this is something that uh, takes effort to work with the private sector to explore developing these new products, but we feel it's an exciting time. Um, uh, and mostly up to this point in time, we've been working with medium-sized enterprises, but we now have McCain's of South Africa very interested in getting into the puree business. And uh, or unfortunately, uh, it was supposed to happen in 2020, a big launch, but because of COVID now uh, postponed. But we do see this as something that could really transform the use and diversified use of sweet potato uh, because really it's a win-win for farmers. And also I should note in our consumer testing, the products have a golden color, which the customers really like, and they like the taste of the orange flesh sweet potato based products better than the 100% wheat flour products. So again, going back to our Sweet Potato for Profit and Health initiative, we've had about 15 organizations which have been strong partners in this because the idea is not only to do research, but to get the outputs of the research, the new varieties, the new seed system techniques, the networks of growers, uh, really build that up so we can make a difference in these target countries. And as was mentioned earlier, by December 2019, we've reached six point three million households in 15 different sub-Saharan African countries. And clearly the foundation of this work in each country is to get um, the locally adapted varieties that producers and consumers want to eat. And you really have to do this for different consumer segments. There's no, you know, really there's no bypassing this step. To help with our capacity strengthening efforts, um, we really spent a great deal of time uh, working on getting the information out under the SPHI. We had four technical working groups that met annually, some specialized in breeding, others in seed and crop management, others in, in marketing, and one on monitoring and evaluation. And in addition, you can get on our Sweet Potato Knowledge Portal a Trainers of Traders Manual on everything you ever wanted to know about sweet potato published in English, Portuguese, Kiswahili, French, and Amharic. And we worked with five national institutions, universities or training institutes in Tanzania, Mozambique, Nigeria, Ghana, and Ethiopia. So they are capable of conducting this 10 day learning by doing course. And then we expect the people trained to go out and train others in their organizations. And through that method, we've been able to generate and help see the step-down training going down to 5,000 different change agents. It was also critical to engage in advocacy at a higher level. And this was done often uh, with other organizations like Harvest Plus or Helen Killen International. So by 2020, we can now say we have 24 countries that have put biofortification as part of their national agriculture and or nutrition agendas, policies, plans, and programs. Now you can get something moving on policy. Our next challenge is to really get investment by the governments in these. And a few have, but many haven't yet. So we need to get that next step going of really uh, convincing people to put more investment into nutritious crops like sweet potato. 
At the regional level, we uh, biofortification included as a strategy in the African Union CADAP process, which is the agricultural plans that are updated annually. And the AU NAPAD nutrition and food uh, systems implementation plan for 2019-2025. And groups like the World Food Program are starting to purchase and utilize biofortified crops as well as the e European Union has a guidance note on fortification that includes biofortification as a promoted strategy. So moving forward, we do see and that sweet potato, in addition to its nutritional benefits, is a climate smart crop. Uh, in the modeling efforts that have been done, uh, it's one of the few crops that you have that really grows from sea level to 2,400 meters in the tropics. Its diverse germplasm can continue to be drawn on to produce more heat tolerant, drought tolerant, and even saline tolerant varieties for Bangladesh we're working on. It's more water use efficient than most grain crops. The early maturing varieties help adaptation to changing length of growing season and coping with drought. One of the real aspects why it's such an important crop in East Africa is in many countries we're running out of land. Land holding size per capita has gone way down. So it has a higher energy output per unit time per unit area than grain crops. Intercropping with the spreading types of varieties may improve soil moisture conservation, reduce weed pressure and lower soil erosion. And we have a huge yield gap still to address. Um, I think if you look at the FAO data, it says the average yields in Africa are six tons per hectare. With our improved varieties with good management, we can get 20 tons per hectare. But in South Africa with inputs and irrigation and good agronomic practices, they get 80 to 90 tons per hectare. So we haven't begun to tap the yield gap sufficiently and to do that, we need the markets because we don't, if we don't have the growing markets, we won't get the incentives that farmers need to invest in greater input use to get higher yields. With increasing CO2 levels, however, it's interesting in these C3 photosynthetic pathway crops like sweet potato and rice, we expect to see yields increase, but the increase is gonna go into carbohydrate accumulation. And so we are concerned that nutrient densities are expected to decline. So if anything, the importance of breeding for micronutrient enhancement in crops has increased uh, and will increase uh, under climate change conditions. In terms of recommended areas for future research, obviously breeding is something we're going to continue focusing on. We're really looking into testing more the use of digital tools because again, the big bottleneck is our seed system constraint to link different stages of the seed system and seed supply to farmers and looking at the costs and efficiency gains by doing so. Um, we want to be able to work on more on integrating sweet potato and diverse cropping systems and soil conditions and understanding water and land use efficiency and the contribution of root system architecture. This traditionally has been a very difficult area for us to get funded, but now there seems to be emerging greater interest in sort of agri-system research. We are going to continue to promote action research where we work directly with the private sector partners in gender transformative process product value chains. We really focus on keeping women involved in these chains as the product commercializes and focusing more on how to trigger that behavioral change in terms of purchasing and consumption behavior. One of the areas we've struggled with and didn't succeed during Sasha was trying to develop um, cost-effective solar powered storage. This is still one of my key goals. Uh, if anybody at Penn State works on uh, cold storage, I would love to talk to them. Uh, because really electricity is just too expensive in most of Sub-Saharan Africa to make uh, cold storage of a crop like sweet potato or most fruits and vegetables viable. So if we can come up with uh, solar powered systems where we have a, 
a greater capital outlay initially, but we can keep it going at low recurrent costs. To me, that's a way forward so we can supply more nutrient dense foods throughout the year and be able to do larger capacity storage of sweet potato for marketing. And we want to continue conducting additional impact studies of our work. So thank you for your attention. I'm ready for questions. I'd like to acknowledge all the support we've received over the past, uh, you know, really uh, 10 years in particular, but 15 years for this effort. Um, that Kofi Annan uh, uh, um, really was very influential in supporting us in the work in West Africa. Clearly, Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, UK Aid, USAID, and we even had Bono come out to the field one day, and he discovered a sweet potato variety that he loved. Of course, nobody in Mozambique knew who Bono was, uh, but uh, um, they did by the time he left. Um, so uh, with that, I will stop and answer any questions that people may have. Thanks for your attention. Thank you so much, Professor Lowe. And thanks again for sharing your inspiring work with us. I'll applaud you on behalf of our audience. Thank you. And <laughs> um, we will now open the floor for 30 minutes of questions from the audience. And we actually already have several questions that have been entered okay. using the Q and A button. So I'll I'll um, you know pose those to you individually. And I encourage our audience to continue to enter questions using the Q and A button. Um, so one of the first questions is from Roland Brower, and uh, they state interesting discussion about research priorities compared with nutrition content of crops. So that was relating to an earlier part of your talk. Um, they didn't understand how one can calculate the deficit and excess in research. And I was wondering if you could elaborate on that. Yes, I, and like I said, this was a proxy analysis and the uh, authors of the article noted there, um, you know, that this isn't the ideal thing. Ideally, you would have the amount of money actually dedicated to each research area. And so he created, he built uh, an index and created a median and really judged things against that median about what he considered deficit amounts of publications relative to the nutritional value and ones where I would, I, I, I would never say there could be excess research on something, but he, he considered it uh, excess uh, research or lots more research compared to the nutrient content and contribution of the crop to the food system. So, you know, it's, it, it, um, so it's, you know, it was an attempt sort of to say, how, how do we, can we get at this until we get better figures? Um, but I think we all know from seeing where research money goes in our international system, we can see what, you know, rice and, and maize get compared to, you know, potato and sweet potato. So I think the figures are out there. Nobody's really pulled them together yet at that disaggregated level. But it's a, it's, it was an attempt to do something based on number of publications. Great, thank you. Um, they have a follow-up question and I'll, I'll sort of weave one of my own questions into this. Um, so they ask, CIP has developed a very interesting approach to the seed system. I, I personally am wondering if you can elaborate a little bit on what you mean exactly by the seed system and how that works in terms of the vegetative versus sexual propagation of sweet potato. Um, I'm letting my plant biology <laughs> geekiness show a little bit here. Uh, and, then, and then Roland asks, can we claim that in Sub-Saharan Africa, sweet potato is a pro-poor crop? And if so, how can we avoid uh, losing capacity to support poorer farmers? Okay, no, I, I do think it's a definitely a pro poor crop in the sense that, you know, people can retain their own sweet potato planting material and people do. Um, and, you know, even if they're retaining, even if they're in a very drought prone area, they can retain small amounts uh, near their washing area in the kitchen, you know, if, uh, you know, traditionally, or people just leave some roots in the ground and they resprout when the roots come. So I think in that sense, it is a very pro-poor crop. 
I know a lot of our efforts have focused on trying to um, improve the image of the sweet potato because it's just seen as a crop of the poor and therefore often by some governments not included in modernization strategies because it's not considered a modern crop, you know. Um, and, and, and so therefore we have been trying to make that image shift. But there's no doubt to me that it, because it will always be a, a crop that will be of great interest to the poor because you know, it's easy for them uh, to grow and retain it. Now, the seed system we've been working on is uh, based on vegetative propagation. Uh, usually just cutting the vine and planting the vine, you get another plant. Uh, what we've been trying to do is get the quality of that material up, right? So after, after something's been out, if they're in what they call a high virus pressure area, which tends to be in bimodal rainfall areas in Central and East Africa. So the virus pressure builds up. Over time, the yields will go down and that planting material needs to be replaced with disease-free planting material, okay? And so that's the complexity in the system is how do you convince people to go out and invest in high quality planting material when they could just get planting material from their neighbors? Um, and so people tend to you know, recycle their planting material or they leave their roots in the ground and they sprout and they get that material. And the triple S method was a way in which to improve the quality of that traditional system because the, the root isn't staying in the ground, getting infected with weevil and degenerating. It's being kept in a safe sand-based container so that the quality uh, can be preserved for the next season. And then you can get a dense amount of roots that are sprouting. Um, so I, I do think um, that uh, we won't lose our capacity to uh, support small farmers. But I think to make sure that happens is we need to keep the focus really as we do on ensuring that women are always a part of the process because there are many examples in Sub-Saharan Africa that when a crop commercializes, women get pushed out as the men come in to take over the income earning. So we actually, when we do some of these marketing initiatives, set targets uh, to ensure female participation and work with our implementing partners to, for them to understand what do we need to do to ensure women can participate. And for example, in Rwanda, when we set up the value chain to link to the agro-processors for the biscuits, we set targets. And we realized that the women's groups that were being managed that were from the poorer households really needed additional training compared to the market-oriented groups um, to be able to produce consistently enough quality roots to supply the processor. So you have to be aware that when you uh, want to keep these targets, it's going to probably take some greater investment and awareness as you move along uh, that, you know, where are the weaknesses in the system and how do we ensure that we don't exclude the poorest households. And I think the nutrition work in particular, when we target households with young children under two, we really are targeting the poorest households in how we recruit and, and form these groups. And one of the challenges is often not to permit communities to self-select, but really go out and identify where are these households and make sure they're approached because oftentimes the most marginal households in a particular community uh, won't necessarily be the ones that will come forward initially to participate in an intervention. Great, thank you. A follow-up um, relating to the triple or double S strategy that you mentioned, um, one of the audience members is asking whether that has been implemented in Zambia and what organizations are involved in advocating the triple S or double S systems? Yes, unfortunately at the moment we did have a project in Zambia. Unfortunately we aren't based in Zambia anymore. 
Uh, so I think uh, by the time we, um, at the time we were in Zambia, we had not uh, been expanding the use of the triple S yet. So if you're in an organization in Zambia and want to try triple S, please look at the sweet potato knowledge portal because we have brochures there and training materials. And it is not a hard thing to start getting off the ground and to start using with uh, local farmers because it really makes sense in unimodal growing situations like you find in Zambia to use something like triple S and double S. Great, thank you. I have a question from Barbara Kennedy um, who organized this lecture series for 25 years. Um, she asks whether your research team is associated with the One Health Commission organization? The One Health Commission organization? No, I don't know that commission organization, but I would like to know it. Um, I, I don't know it. Uh, maybe she can explain it to me. That'd be great. And I see she also wants recipes. www.sweetpotatoknowledge.org has some great recipes on it under the recipe section. So please try them out. Um, and uh, I, I think uh, sweet potato is one of these things that you can just make into anything you want, really. Uh, anything you could, I always say anything you can do with potato or cassava, you can do with sweet potato. You might have to prepare it a little differently depending on the variety, but you can do it. And uh, it's it, clearly the wheat flour substitution is something that we're big on. Um, but we, you can incorporate it in, into salads and into cooked materials, and you can make a sweet potato beverage that's quite nice as well. That's great. I'll probably implement some of those own strategies with my children who Good. don't like pure sweet potatoes, but we can sneak them into their food in various ways. <laughs> yeah, that's right. That's right. They don't like sweet potatoes. Oh, no. I know. It's uh, a shame. <laughs> um, Barbara Kennedy also has another question uh, and asks whether there are locations in addition to Africa that could benefit from your sweet potato research or that might extrapolate from your model to improve farming in other parts of the planet. Yes. Uh, in fact, in my work has been based in Sub-Saharan Africa, but SIP is a global organization. Uh, so we're also doing uh, sweet potato and particularly orange flesh sweet potato work in uh, Odisha, in uh, the Orissa region of India. Um, we have a, a very large uh, uh, effort also going on in uh, Vietnam. Clearly we're in Latin America, so in Peru, um, Ecuador. We're just moving into Haiti, which has a great need and sweet potato should be doing well there. Um, Bangladesh is another place where uh, our work on sweet potato is, is quite uh, expanding. Um, and if we, SIP has a partnership and in a shared institute with China. Now, frankly, China doesn't need any help on sweet potato. China is the world's leading producer of uh, sweet potato and now of potato as well. But it's mostly for information and research exchange um uh because you name it china does it with sweet potato they can they make every processed product in the world they have a two billion dollar sweet potato noodle industry um you know they have no problem with diversified use of sweet potato um but uh, uh clearly there is much more to be done in other countries and in other african countries as well we'd like to expand the use of sweet potato Great, thank you. I have two questions from the patron of our lecture series, Abe Ashtakar. Oh, um, so uh, first off, he thanks you very much for the inspiring talk full of information and more importantly, for all the work you do in Africa. Um, their first question is, what are the factors that led you to choose the specific countries you chose both for the pilot and subsequent larger follow-ups? Yeah, the, in, in terms of the country choice, basically, we based it on uh, data on where sweet potato was growing the most and where we felt we could have the most impact within the first 10 years. Um, in, you know, 
West Africa in that regard was underrepresented, uh, underrepresented because the statistics were so poor in West Africa. And so now in a subsequent phase, we'd really like to expand into more West African countries. Um, in the first phase, we just had Nigeria, Ghana, and Burkina Faso, but clearly, you know, we could do a lot more in the rest of the West African region. Um, so that was, and then we overlap the ability to grow sweet potato with the degree of vitamin A deficiency. So those were the two major factors for the initial country selection. And then South Africa is in as a, as a sort of a strategic partner because obviously they, they had a very good breeding program for sweet potato. They're more commercially oriented sweet potato production, but actually South Africa was breaking into doing more smallholder use of sweet potato within South Africa. So they weren't quite in the same league with the other countries, but they were included as a strategic partner in part for the research effort. Great, thank you. And uh, Dr. Ashtakar's second question is whether there are similar projects to improve the nutritional value of traditional diets in Asia, for example, based on rice, rice and wheat. Um, and one example would be Bangladesh, as, as you mentioned. Yes. Well, as you, um, there's quite a bit of uh, work, you know, trying to look at. Um, uh, in terms of biofortifications, uh, zinc-enhanced rice that's done conventionally. Um, one of the um, transgenic biofortified crops, all of our work is conventional, but uh, the golden rice is a famous example uh, that I think has faced a lot of legal and uh, barriers. So it's sort of still not off the ground in the Philippines. Um, but I think what's interesting in Asia um, for us and our work is really the integration. Uh, because we have short duration potato and sweet potato varieties, there's a lot of interest in including these crops as rotation crops in between, uh, you know, your wheat and potato or, you know, we, we did a study in Uganda uh, that would be very applicable for the Bangladesh situation where uh, actually a rice sweet potato rotation is superior in terms of total output than going rice, rice, or sweet potato, sweet potato. And basically the two crops are complementary uh, to each other. Um, and so I think that's the kind of integrated crop work uh, in, in the sustainability context that we need to do more of and promote more of to move forward. Uh, so it's the nutrient enhancement of the individual crops, but also creating healthier cropping systems and sustaining those yields over time through better rotation practices and taking real advantage of the short season crops like sweet potato in, in the case of Uganda, the irrigation scheme doesn't have enough water level during the, the non-rainy season to do in a second crop of rice. So they were just leaving it fallow. Putting the sweet potato in, you're utilizing the land, but also it broke up the rice and, uh, problems and they said they had fewer weeds in the next round of rice. So, you know, that kind of win-win in terms of rotation strategies is, is is uh, another way forward as well, because you can put in a three month sweet potato variety or a three month, we're even breeding now for even sh two month potato varieties to fit into these windows um, in these uh, densely populated areas in Asia and Africa. Great, thank you. One question uh, from another attendee is, asking you to speak a bit more about um, what the barriers are to cold storage technology. And is it only an electricity source issue or are there other barriers? Yeah, um, the, you know, obviously, um, I think in terms of cold storage, the, the cost of electricity and the irregularity of supply are the two big issues in a lot of uh, sub-Saharan African countries, unless that electricity is, 
um, subsidized like it is in Ethiopia. Um, but in, in most countries, when you just do the economics of keeping you know, the lights on in a cold storage unit, um, it becomes too expensive per ton to store for longer periods of time. So that's where the solar technology looks in, uh, promising. And over time, the cost of that technology is coming down. So, uh, you know, everybody is experimenting with um, cool bots and sort of how do you modify your air conditioning unit and turn it into a cooling unit. And so there's some very clever things happening out there, but all those clever things to date have been running off electricity. So I think that's where more work needs to be done. And then you have simpler methods, you know, where you can have um, sort of, um, uh, cooling chambers that you water or whatever. But again, those tend to be labor intensive and can't hold the large tonnage. So somehow it's, it's what, what the challenge is getting to the scale and keeping uh, having the cost be realistic given the price that people are willing to pay for the crop. And, sure. Uh, sure. So that, that's, that's why it's, I think it's a really interesting area where we need some breakthrough work. Um, uh, and I think uh, would not only open up um, crops like sweet potato to greater year round use on a commercial level, particularly for urban areas, but really help the vegetable and fruit industry as well. That's great. As, as a follow up, I'm reminded um, of some of the spring houses that accompany older farms in Pennsylvania and how farmers, you know, starting in the 16 and 1700s even used those to, to do cool, cool storage of their, of their crops and other resources. Um, that obviously becomes a little bit harder in, in more arid areas that don't have access to, to many streams like we do here in Pennsylvania. But I'm curious if you have, you or others are aware of efforts to uh, integrate cooling into irrigation strategies. So using water that's no, already being- I don't, I don't I'm gonna follow up with you on that, Charles. That sounds very interesting. Because in some areas we could make that work. Obviously it has to be an area with lots of water. And of right. course in, in Irish potato, it's easier because you can store those easily if you're in the highlands in cool temperatures, you can use very simple storage facilities, but uh, sweet potato is a bit trickier because it has right. to be cured in a high humidity, high heat environment for five to six days, then cooled. So it's, it's, a, it's a harder uh, storage strategy. But I'd be very interested to learn more about the water stream idea. Great, yeah, we'll follow up. Um, I have a question from Scott Thomas in the audience asking, is soil depletion an issue with sweet potatoes? And if so, has the research been conducted to explore crops to be grown in rotation with sweet potatoes to keep the soil healthy? Yes, good question, Scott. And uh, yes, it is an issue. Um, uh, we, um, you know, one of the reasons that sweet potato is liked by smallholder farmers is they can get a crop on marginal soils or they can get a crop without inputs. Um, so, you know, it's, it's only your most commercially oriented farmers that would be, you know, engaging much in, in, in any kind of fertilizer purchase. Um, and that tends to be in West Africa where the soils are really heavily depleted. Um, so, uh, but sweet potato is extracted. There's no question about it. One of the reasons you get yields is because it's extracting. So at some point you have to put more back in. And uh, we've done limited work because this has been the hardest area to get money on um, to do research, but we have been doing work uh, in terms of rotations with cow peas, pigeon peas that look very promising as strategies for you know, really helping get that nutrient retention uh, and uh, limiting that yield decline. It's very important not to plant sweet potato after sweet potato. We know rotation is key because you will see a yield drop off if you do that. Um, so 
I think this is an area that urgently needs more work. Uh, and I'm quite pleased. I mean, this year, the World Food Prize winner was Dr. Lal, uh, Ratan Lal, who was a soil scientist um, who has been screaming about this for years, about the need to invest in soils and healthy soils are our future. And the degree of degradation in soils in Sub-Saharan Africa is substantial. And at some point, you have to put something back in. And so I think a combination of inorganic and organic will be the way forward. Uh, but really proper rotation and intercropping systems uh, is the um, something that is has to be much more a part of the system than it has been so far. Great, thank you. Roland Brower has one more question, um, which is asking whether there's a correlation between dry matter and yield. And they can imagine that higher dry matter and nutrient denser crops might have lower yields per hectares as a lot of the year yield might be water. Yes, uh, you're correct. Exactly. And that's why if you're really doing, uh, uh, oftentimes breeders will report uh, results it depends on, on the kind of analysis they're doing, but often the best way to truly compare varieties is on what we call a dry weight basis, where you measure the dry matter and then you report the yields on a dry weight basis. That's much fairer because water weighs. And sure, if you just go out to a field and you've got a 20% uh, you know, dry matter variety and a 30% dry matter variety, chances are that 20% is gonna out yield it tremendously. Um, so, you know, water is heavy. And, and so I think in, when you do some of these comparisons, you should really do it on a dry weight basis. Great, thank you. Lam Hood has a question, um, a comment first, which is an additional benefit of substituting, substituting sweet potatoes for wheat might be a gluten reduction and wondering if you could elaborate on the potential health benefits of that substitution. Ah, uh, yeah, um, that's, that's true, it is. Sweet potato does not have gluten, which is why you can't substitute all of the wheat <laughs> if you want your bread to rise. So that's why we have to play around with the amounts that we can substitute, and that's why we can substitute higher percentages when, when it's a flat bread as opposed to a, a, a bread that rises. So yes, definitely. And the other big thing that sweet potato has is very good dietary fiber content. Uh, so it's, it tends to be uh, slowly digested. Um, and, um, and then we just did some analysis of our sweet potato breads. A paper has just come out. And it, you know the starch it's producing is a more resistant starch uh, in these breads. So it, it is a healthier bread. Um, uh, which is a real, uh, not only does it taste good, um, but it is also a bread that has some characteristics that I think people will truly want from the health standpoint. Great, thank you so much. We have one more question, and this is related to something that I think you mentioned uh, a little earlier, um, asking what processed foods might be made with sweet potatoes that could retain nutrients through those processing steps. You know, it's, it's um, sweet potato fortunately has usually has a pretty high retention uh, of beta carotene when it's processed and it's starting the, the medium to dark intensity orange varieties have so much to start with. So most of them lose 20 to 25% when they're processed into some form. Um, We've done, uh, we haven't done, but bioaccessibility studies have been done. And it's, it's an interesting thing in terms of the beta carotene content because oil, you know, uh, beta carotene is an, uh, uh, and vitamin A is an oil-based nutrient, right? So if you have a little bit of oil in the product that enhances your, your vitamin A absorption and your vitamin A bioaccessibility, so actually your highest retention and, and greatest amount of vitamin A that you'll get um, is from fried sweet potato products because of the oil. 
it's sort of ironic. Now I won't ever say your your fried fry is the best thing to eat, but you'll if you take the same variety and you fry it versus bake it, you're going to get more beta carotene out of the fried. Yeah, uh, according to these bioaccessibility studies. Clearly, boiling is a, a, a good way to also get plenty of nutrients with minimum loss. Um, uh, the greatest loss is actually uh, in baking. Uh, so fried are the best, then steamed or boiled, then baked. Um, uh, but even with a higher loss with the baked, relatively speaking, in terms of bioaccessibility, you still get enough uh, uh, beta carotene to meet the daily needs of a young child because you're starting at such a high level. Uh, where you would really lose the nutrients is if you, if you do something like make noodles because you're doing a lot of starch extraction and then you tend to lose a lot of micronutrients. But your juices and your processed products in general have good retention levels. Great, thank you. I don't know about our audience, but all this, this talk is making me a little hungry. It's lunchtime here in Pennsylvania. <laughs> yes. um, so, so keeping that in mind, uh, that will conclude our, our 30 minute question and answer period. Um, I wanna thank everyone for attending this first presentation of the Ashtakar Frontiers of Science lectures in the Eberly College of Science. Um, and also thank Dr. Lowe again for all of your wonderful presentation and, and answers to our questions. So thank you again. Um, Thanks. Our next lecture will be on Saturday, January 30th, using the same Zoom link as we use today when Joyce Joes, Assistant Professor in the Department of Biochemistry and Molecular Biology here at Penn State, will present a talk entitled Targeted Therapeutic Intervention Strategies for SARS-CoV-2 Related to the COVID-19 Pandemic. So again, thank you, Dr. Lowe, and I wish everyone a very good week. Thank you, and to all the participants for staying until the bitter end. Thanks.